Alex Bulkley and Corey Campadonico are the producers of Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio. They are also the co-founders and co-owners of the animation studio production company Shadow Machine. I'm Matt Noble of Gold Derby. And I thought I'd just start off by asking you guys on this project, what was one of the biggest things you learnt? And we'll start with Alex. All right. Well, um, you learn uh, a, a lot on every production. Uh, Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio, aside from how to accomplish uh, a vision from a filmmaker like Guillermo, uh, a filmmaker like Mark Gustafson, um, you, what we really learned was how to uh, make stop motion uh, in the midst of a pandemic. <laughs> it was, uh, you know, uh, already a very complicated uh, production, as you can imagine, very meticulous, uh, very time consuming. And, uh, you know, right in the front end of our production, um, you know, there was this global moment, uh, uh, a shutdown. Um, and we not only persevered um, with this amazing crew, but uh, we probably became better for it. And I think, you know, for Corey and I, you know, as we talk about, you know, how to extract beauty from adversity, this whole idea of, of uh, a, a crew um, uh, really having a lifeline at a studio and the work that they do uh, becoming more than just, you know, a film we're making, but really uh, building a culture of artistry. And it was just incredible to see a team come together um, and not only accomplish what we were able to accomplish, but uh, like each other um, at the end. Mm. Corey? Yeah, I, I'd add um, to build off of that. I think one of the um, really interesting things that kind of came out of this production, but also the pandemic was the idea that creative processes, you know, are flexible and there are new ways to go about looking at solving creative problems. And I think sometimes something like a pandemic forces the hand a little bit for things, even like, you know, what we're doing right now, Zooms and, and the ability to communicate in different ways, um, obviously just from a technological standpoint, but also from a creative standpoint, you know, there's been so many ways um in you know in, in in the entertainment business that we're all accustomed to um you know having been brought up on and and used to uh over the last you know we're not 100 years old but we're, we're getting there um you know but there's there's just things that have just been tried and true and have never been tested in different ways and i think what has been so exciting is that um there's a whole new kind of world of, of tools available to create you know projects and, and we certainly utilized every single one of them and we'll continue to do so in the future. So it's, it's been real eye opening that, uh, you know, sometimes when you challenge old ways, you know, really new and innovative processes, you know, evolve from it. And it's, it's quite exciting. It, it's interesting, Corey, you talk about challenging sort of old ways of, of, of doing this because this, the, like a big message of this film, Pinocchio is about not conforming and not doing things just the way things have been done before and not uh, the way other people are doing things. And you have, with uh, Shadow Machine, done stop motion before. Is there a particular thing that you can think of that you did differently or that you sort of innovated through this film and sort of challenged the old way of doing sort of stop motion? Um, either of you can take this. I'll take the first part of it, which I think, you know, just from a storytelling perspective, Alex and I have been um, extremely excited about this project for a long time because the, you know, the vision that Guillermo had and the the story is very different than a lot of the other stop motion movies that have been done over the years, which I think is is, is a really intriguing um, uh, kind of window into, you know, films that could come from this film in the future that have kind of a different um, storytelling uh pacing and, and and kind of process and i think that's you know really opened up uh, on this process so i don't know that that's something that we necessarily innovated as a stop motion process but certainly as a storytelling process led by guillermo um, that i think is going to lead to a bunch of new films that kind of breaks out of the mold of what stop motion has typically been associated with storytelling wise um, i think that's really exciting yeah and i can, I can add to that and that 
you know, early in our stop motion days, um, you know, we were forced just with the, the time and the money that we could put towards certain projects to really empower the artists we were working with. Um, so you think of an animator suddenly having um, a lot more uh, 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 faculties to really uh, um, do their best work, whether it's in performance or lighting or camera or whatever it might be. Similarly, uh, with Guillermo, what he wanted to do is empower the animators to perform. Um, this is a, 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 a relatively new thing for this film, though, you know, uh, again, was sort of treated out of necessity in, you know, the old days, um, you know, where uh, a lot of the innovation in stop motion has come from replacement faces and uh, uh, 3D printing and other ways to really um, smooth out the rough edges of stop motion. Um, as, as you probably noticed, Guillermo was adamant that we treat the animators like actors. They would go onto their stages and they would perform and they had a lot of latitude to bring their best um, skills, talent, insight into the storytelling, the characters and everything else um, in a way that was really exciting. I think both for the animators and ultimately for the audience to see what um, what these amazing um, artists can do. It, it was like like Guillermo comes in with a bit of a live action sensibility. Uh, you guys have the experience with animation. You bring in those sensibilities. Um, how did those two things sort of work together? Sort of a animation background and a live action background come together to tell the one story and make the one film. Um, I can start this one, Corey, if, if, if it sounds good. And yeah. I think, you know, the, um, you know, a lot of what Guillermo brings as a filmmaker, um, you know, is can often be at odds with a very precise, almost surgical animation process. Animation is built on a blueprint and that blueprint is executed with great precision, especially, you know, in stop motion, particularly in stop motion. So when you see those two things collide, again, that that collision really was on the stages themselves where you know the the flaws the charm and imperfections of stop motion was not something that Guillermo or Mark wanted to hide from they wanted to um, really encourage it in a way that you know these are inanimate objects slowly being photographed and you know these animators are breathing life into these uh um you know, these inanimate puppets um, on these sets and building a world um, that, you know, really, um, I think, uh, created both, you know, a, a, a charm, but an authenticity um, to the, the storytelling at the end. And I'd say that, you know, keep in mind that, you know, Guillermo, and as he's spoken about many times in this in this process, is that he started in, in stop motion and really has a fundamental understanding of, of animation and stop motion in particular um, that goes way, way, way back. And really, you know, when, when you're talking about stop motion, it, it's a very unique art form. And the combination of the, the rules that exist in live action are very familiar and, and and prevalent in stop motion in a way that's different than CG. So really the merging of the two is, is very uh, symbiotic and, and and very kind of, um, you know, each builds on the other. And so I think that that merging those, the format plus obviously Guillermo's history and, and um, uh, success in live action is obviously a, a dangerous pairing mm -hmm. in, a good, in a good way. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I guess like, Talking about like stop motion, it's it's an it's a it's a storytelling device, art form, filmmaking like approach that has lasted a long period of time as new types of filmmaking and stuff have emerged and things. It has lasted, but it's probably like never, at least sort of in my sort of growing up a childhood, ever been the like dominant or predominant form of animation, right? That's out there. So like, do you want to each of you sort of comment on why you think uh, stop motion has lasted um as technology has advanced and like what is sort of so special about that uh, and unique about telling stories in that way and also like maybe why it also isn't the main way that films are uh, and tvs animated 
I mean, do you want me to go first, Corey, or you want to go first? Sure. Oh, I got an answer. You got an answer. It doesn't matter. I mean, it, I'll start. I think there's 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 two two questions, and there really is one is you know I think when we touched on this earlier, which is you know a lot of it is is types of stories being told, and I think that's where Alex and I get extremely excited is that that there's really still an unbelievable wealth of stories to be told in stop motion that weren't typically associated with stop motion. The other thing is that, you know, when, when everybody in the entertainment business started, whether they went to film school or they started as a kid moving around their, their toys in their room, everyone's shot a stop motion film either in their heads or with mm -hmm. a, you know, with an old super eight. And, and so everyone has a connection to the medium and it really is the oldest form of, of cinema that there is. And so I think there's a nostalgia to that, that that's really unique and incredible. And, um, you know, as Guillermo says best, you know, stop motion is always on the edge of, of extinction and always has been. And, you know, we like to think that we're on the verge of maybe opening up a whole new kind of Pandora's box when it comes to the types of stories that could be told in stop motion that weren't previously thought to be told in stop motion. And, uh, you know, hopefully we're right. Yeah. And, and you know, stop motion, um, that's exactly right. And, and stop motion has gone through sort of peaks and valleys. It has its moments where, you know, a project will come out and everyone wonders where stop motion has been. And then every once in a while, people look at it and they're like, that's, you know, there's there's good and bad, like every format. Um, you know, we've seen a lot in the past where it leaned into the nostalgia. People remember Rankin Bass and remember Harryhausen in a way that, you know, has meaning um, to the story. What Guillermo and Mark both did um, for Pinocchio was take stop motion as this magical ingredient into the storytelling it became um the only way to tell this story um and it became that that tool of magic that that allowed sort of a wonder and an awe in its execution and i think that's to what corey's saying and that's to what i think the audience is responding to is something that is exciting and innovative as a format it's never gone anywhere it's just a question of how it's used um, and um, I, I think Pinocchio was just a great example of form, uh, you know, sort of um, enhancing the content. Mm, yeah. Uh, speaking of the content, what do each of you think is sort of uh, special or magical about this story? Uh, Corey, we'll stop you. I think the the thing that you know moves me the most, just not being involved with the film, but but just watching it as a, a as an audience member, you know, is the um, the simplicity of it and the connection to the simple truths that I think we all you know think about, but maybe don't focus on on a daily basis. Which is, you know, how long are we here on Earth? What's important, and what are we actually trying to do with our relationships and our connections to other people? And it's you know obviously that's the core of any great story is 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 figuring out kind of the the why to human existence. But I think in this film in particular, it's just it's so simple and obvious. Yet all the characters have to go through a whole um, journey to kind of arrive at that uh, at that answer and and figure out that what's right in front of them is is so important, and uh, they already have everything they need. And I think that's the, the simplicity and everything that I hear from everybody that that really is affected by the movie um, really comes back to that simple, you know, simple premise. Hmm. Yeah. Alex? yeah it, there's just a, there's a universe, universality. Is that a word? Universality? Yeah, sure. To the, the experience. It's, you know, is, is we often get into these stories, um, the um you sort of put yourself into the shoes of a protagonist and and try your best to to you know you know share that experience but you know i, I think there's something uh, a bigger impact with this film and and you know you could see it early it being such a long production i i feel like that that early you know sort of magic that you know that the guillermo brought in in uh you know the screenplay uh the the guy and kurt and rob all brought in this moment of building out this world um uh 
you know, all the way into the the music and sort of as we started to fill this thing out, you could see it early, you could see it coming and wow, the timing to tell this story today um, is uh, incredible. I mean, it just doesn't lean on the same um, hooks that so many other stories today um, lean on. It's It's got a, you know, a, a sort of an evergreen message that is really powerful um, and, and, maybe more today than ever mm. uh like and it, it, i believe you guys have known each other a while right you've known each other since grade school yeah it's like yeah, yeah like right. you've known yeah. each other since grade school you've started uh you started a, a shadow machine together in around 99 i i believe and uh it's funny yeah, yeah. gold derby our website started around that time as well oh, right yeah. so yeah we've been, we've been around for a similar amount of time um you guys have won an emmy together for robot chicken in 2010 like with such a long sort of like time of knowing each other working with each other, which with each other uh what do you what do you learn from each other what it, like through this relationship <laughs> i'm not sure this is for uh on camera conversation but, uh, <laughs> you know look I, alex and i have known each other we've been through so many facets of life that we've we've you know grown up together since we were six years old we played sports together we were in a band together we went to college on and off together we started this company when we didn't know, you know, anything really um, in our early 20s. And it's grown from there. And I think one of the things that is um, just so tremendous, really, about being able to work with someone that you care about so much is the fact that, you know, we're, we're very symbiotic in, in being able to kind of, you know, fill in the gaps and think about things, you know, in asymmetrical ways that really, you know, allows us to, to approach projects from, the position of like, how do we get from A to B in the best way possible? And, you know, there's a lot of ideas that are both that are thrown into that mix that kind of, you know, get us to a place where we typically finish projects and, and get them out and up on air and really have a chance of success. And so it's, it's just a, um, it's, 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 there's a lot of symbiosis to, to, to having that kind of shorthand. Yeah. yeah. And, and trust, I mean, we're in, you know, an industry that is known for swimming sharks and flying arrows and what better way to navigate treacherous waters than with somebody you trust. You know, we've, we've got a shorthand, you know, we've been, you know, as, as close of friends and business partners, our families, you know, you just think of like how important it is to go into the trenches of big, exciting uh, productions knowing that you, you know, enjoy the people you work with. Um, it's just, uh, you know, we're, we're very lucky and, and count our blessings on that level a lot because it's not true. A lot of people just spend most of their life looking over their shoulder. And, you know, we, we are lucky in that we can, we like what we do. We work with good people and we think it ends up on screen. Mm. And we're just beginning. That's the best part. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Just the start. Yeah. Well, do, do you ever like uh, when you're working on a production like Pinocchio, uh, like think back to those sort of times when you were just starting the company back in 99 in a, in a, gar a garage, correct? Like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, all the time. Yeah. Yeah. So. In fact, I wasn't with Alex this last week, but I was talking about our bird shop in our original office. It wasn't, it, it was a bird shop on Melrose. It's actually converted quite funny. Shop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was a converted bird shop. And once we had like a hundred square feet of office to begin with, we were like, yeah. we, thought, we thought we had basically made it and we had arrived. Yeah. That was the coolest feeling. Yeah. But uh, yeah. our, our original office turned into uh, Ed Hardy and then into <laughs> uh, to Vaughn Dutch for a minute. So there's a lot of history with where, with where we started. But um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it's, it, um, it echoes in everything we do and in the same spirit in which we started out um you just end up surrounding yourself with people who are better at all those little pieces so whether you know um a, as you sort of build momentum um you build uh bigger better projects um it's basically the same thing with just more tools um to play with and you know i think um you know our philosophy is exactly the same it's just now a question of like you know we're you know give us the keys to that you know 
fun car and we will drive it the same way we did in 1999 um just with a little bit more gray in our beards you know mm -hmm. yeah and, and that's an important point because when we came into stop motion and we originally started it in that same office that, that yeah. i was talking about we had um stop motion had really taken a a uh, a tumble on the in the television space because it was so expensive and we really kind of i'm not going to say we reinvented it but we certainly teamed up with some incredible um people that really you know really passionate about the space and created a model in robot chicken and for adult swim for a number of years that was um you know we were able to kind of breathe some life into in, into the format in the television space and the lessons you learn on that were absolutely applied you know at the highest level of production on pinocchio when you, you you still have to figure out and solve problems in ways that you know you might not have um you know all the resources to do and so you have to be creative about those solutions yeah that's right oh but must have been fun when you were like you know working on uh designing like the angel and you're working on the the feathers and the bird wings bring you back to that office in the bird shop <laughs> Oh, it's just, yeah. it's an incredible, um, it's an incredible team and workshop. Yeah. Um, and it does, it has all those, you know, uh, uh, the same materials, you know, the same uh, general tools, just at a higher level. And, um, oh my gosh, we, Corey and I just had the pleasure of going to the uh, MoMA exhibit hmm. where they have taken, you know, basically uh, portions of our studio, moved it from Portland to New York City, lit it, cleaned it up a little bit, lit it really nicely. And oh my gosh, it is a, a total thrill. I think Corey and I's mouths dropped for at least two minutes as we walked in, because it's just, it is the studio now on display in this you know incredible museum. It's really wow. wild. And so, I think what's so cool about that too, is that, you know, all joking aside, it's like the 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 spotlight is on the artists that actually create the material right. mm -hmm. and you know you know we can talk to people and we can we can talk to you and stuff but the artists that that work on you know in the weeds on the actual art that's sitting in MoMA is uh, the best expression of their talent at the highest level and I think that's really what made Alex and I so proud is just to be a part of of their artistry um on display you know for for everyone to see so I think that was just an incredible um that you should see it if you're ever out in New York in the next three or four months. It's out there till April 15th, I believe. There you go. Fantastic. And um, people can go to goldderby.com to watch uh, interviews with some of those artists, like the production designers, the animation supervisors, and uh, the sound uh, designer as well. So uh, goldderby.com, the place to make award predictions, watch other interviews. I think that's a great place to end our conversation. Corey and Alex, thanks so much for your time today and all the best of luck for Pinocchio with the Oscars and other awards that are all coming down the pipeline. It's doing, doing pretty well in Gold Derby odds. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Pleasure. Thanks, Matt.